Let me just make sure that worked. It's saying starting recording. Okay. Great. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, during your lunch hour. <laughs> to um, hear about some very important things going on. Um, we have a special uh, speaker here today. Her name is Kate Brindle, and she is a senior public policy specialist for farm animal protection with the Humane Society of the United States. There she works on legislative campaigns across the country. Kate and her teammates lead campaigns to prohibit the cage confinement of chickens, pigs, and calves. She's helped pass laws banning confinement in Colorado, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and excitingly, um, New Jersey was just recently added to the list, um, and we'll hear more about that. Uh, Kate serves as a board member of attorneys for animals and is the chair of the animal law section of the State Bar of Michigan. She's a graduate of NYU, which we were just talking about, and of Michigan State University College of Law, where she served as an associate editor of the Journal for Animal and Natural Resource Law and president of the Student Animal League Defense Fund. And we were just talking about how um, Kate has a real history of helping to give animals a voice. So um, so thank you again for uh, being with us today and I turn it over to Kate. Well, thank you so much for that nice introduction and, and for having me. I am going to go ahead and share my screen here. just loading for a second here. Okay, is everybody able to see that? It's a picture of me actually, so okay, great. Um, so, well, again, thank you so much for, for inviting me to join you. Um, today, I'm gonna be talking about the current state of industrial animal agriculture and some of the problems with it, and also the campaigns that HSUS is waging to fight against cruelty towards farm animals. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about my story as well um, of how, how I got into the work. Um, I do wanna give a little bit of a disclaimer here that I may be showing some photos that, that might be a little bit hard to look at in the beginning of the presentation. Uh, there, there won't be any video or, or sounds or anything like that, but I, I do have a few pictures of, of animals, farm animals who are who are in confinement. So in our society, unfortunately, there's there's a gap between what people believe and what the meat industry pitches sometimes is kind of like these cartoonish images of you know these animals kind of frolicking in the fields and, and having this happy red barn and what really happens on factory farms and so one of our jobs that that we see at hsus is to open people's eyes to the horrors and misery of factory farming and to to let people know what what's truly going on um, behind closed doors so Meeting Place Magazine, which is an industry publication named the Humane Society of the United States or HSUS as the most credible farm animal care information source. So that's something that we're really proud of. And so before getting into what farm animals face and the way organizations are fighting for them, I would like to start uh, with a picture of, of who we're working for and why we're doing this. Um, much like our dogs and cats at home, egg-laying hens like the one in this picture, they want to have a good life. They want to walk around and play and make connections with friends and family. And the same is true for pigs and kittens. Neither one of them wants to suffer. Neither one of them wants to be in pain. But unfortunately, as we know in our society, our dogs and cats who we share our homes with, they often have a really good life. But the vast majority of farm animals in the United States are confined in factory farms. And so that's really, that's kind of part of my story and, and how I got involved in the farm animal protection movement. I, I had dogs, 
growing up who I was really close to. And, you know, I came to realize that it's like we we often treat our dogs uh, really well. But, you know, farm animals like this pig here, they have the same ability to feel pain, the same ability to suffer as as our dogs and cats. And unfortunately, um, there's not a lot of laws that protect these animals at all. And so, you know, there are anti-cruelty laws that, that protect companion animals or dogs and cats. But I mean, some of the things that you could, if you did that to a companion animal, if you did that to a farm animal, um, it would be illegal with a dog and cat, but because it's standard practice with farm animals, it's it's often just business as usual. So that's how I first got involved with the movement. I was actually 13 years old, and so I, I've been involved um, with advocating for farm animals ever since. And you know, I, I people care about farm animals. Um, a 2018 Ketchum study found that animal welfare was the number one cause of interest to Americans. And a Gallup poll indicated that 94% of US adults believe animals deserve protection from harm and exploitation. And this is precisely why farm animals are hidden from view and they're kept in systems like this. It's because if the public knew what was going on, they'd be outraged. So. Um, one of our purposes of our organization and campaign is to expose these systems of factory farming and the cruelty that goes along with it. And so if you've ever visited a farm sanctuary, um, and, I, and I highly recommend it, um, you know that chickens are individuals. You know, some like to be held and cuddled and some don't. For example, this chicken, let's call her Jenny, seems, you know, seems pretty cozy. And Jenny wants to walk around and scratch and, and just express basic behavior. She wants to spend time with friends and lay eggs in a nesting area. But imagine Jenny having this life instead, life in a cage. And it's not just Jenny. It's Jenny and several other birds who are crammed into filthy, barren cages every second of their lives along with her. And these cages, they're so small, the birds cannot even spread their wings. And that's how they spend their entire life. So it's basically this meager amount of space, which translates to each bird having space that's smaller than an iPad. And they're virtually unable to move, again, for their entire lives. And it's not just Jenny, it's roughly 190 million egg-laying hens in this country. And the same thing is true with mother pigs, you know, take Sally, for example. She wants to run outside. She's highly inquisitive. She wants to explore her surroundings. And scientists, I, I always like to cite this because I think it's pretty cool. Scientists have found that Sally and pigs like her are as smart as dogs. And pigs have actually been taught to play video games. And they're so smart that they learn to play as fast as chimpanzees and even faster than three-year-old human children. But again, most mother pigs, they don't have a life like that. Most mother pigs used by the pork industry are confined to gestation crates, which are metal cages so small the pigs are nearly immobilized. They can't even turn around or take more than a step forward or backward. And because of this lack of movement, their muscles and bones deteriorate. And because these animals, they're so intelligent and they're denied any sort of mental stimulation. So many become neurotic and they start engaging in these repetitive coping behaviors, such as constantly biting the metal bars in front of them. And they're confined in these crates for virtually their entire lives through repeated pregnancy cycles. And essentially they're they're lined up like parked cars in confinement facilities. So Dr. Temple Grandin once compared the sort of confinement to if humans had to be confined for, for almost their entire lives to an airline seat. So while these pictures can certainly be difficult to look at, it's important to remember that, that this is Sally's life day in and day out. And it's not just Sally's life, but it's millions of mother pigs like her. And so this is why we feel it's so important to, to fight so hard to get animals out of these cruel confinement conditions. So how are we doing this? And how are we, and I mean, it's not just us, it's a lot of other organizations. How are we taking this on? And how are we winning? Well, in a few different ways. So I'll start with our corporate work. 
um, were waging campaigns to get the largest food corporations to mandate changes within their supply chain and adopt cage-free policies for eggs and crate-free policies for pork. And actually, um, Dr. Kip and I were just talking about how Connecticut-based Subway has a policy. We were able to work with them, and we've worked with over 200 companies all across the country to, um, to get policies. And so this is just an example of a lot of the companies that, that do currently have cage-free and crate-free policies. But we really, we really think it's not enough to commit to going cage free or crate free. I mean, it's it's fantastic when they adopt a policy, but we want to know that these companies are following through. So we're pressing them to do just that. So um, one of the things we did after a year spent auditing more than 90 of the companies, I'm sorry, of the country's largest food companies, we released the country's first ever food industry scorecard. And basically what this initiative does is it holds companies accountable by measuring their progress in animal welfare pledges while calling out companies that have yet to make commitments. And so we graded each company, ranked them, and provided a thorough analysis of how they should move forward. And so kind of using uh, the scorecard as a jumping off point, we then engaged the country's largest food companies about their animal welfare policies, pressing them to do even more for farm animals. And so it's not just food corporations. We also want to ban the cruel practice of extreme confinement of farm animals. And here's a map of all the states where we have waged and won legislative campaigns. So just to hit some highlights here, 11 states no longer allow or are phasing out the use of gestation crates for mother pigs. 10 states have banned the use of veal crates for baby calves, and 11 states ban or restrict the use of battery cages for chickens. And in a, in a big victory, um, earlier this year, actually, it just happened this summer, you'll see that uh, that New Jersey is on there. They, uh, they just passed a law after over a decade of campaigning to ban gestation crates for mother pigs and veal crates for baby calves. So that was... Um, you know, it, it was a long time in the making, but we were very excited um, when they finally passed that and the, the governor signed it into law. But it's not enough to ban the extreme confinement in the production of eggs, pork, and veal. We also want to ban the sale of these products from cage facilities. And we've worked successfully in eight states to pass laws that ban both the production and the sale of eggs from hens in extreme confinement. So in those states, um, it, it wouldn't matter where those products were produced. It would, for example, in Massachusetts has a law. So um, it wouldn't matter where the eggs were produced, if they were produced using cages, whether they were produced in Massachusetts or outside of Massachusetts, you wouldn't be able to sell in the Massachusetts marketplace if those eggs came from uh, chickens in confinement. And so this is an example of one of our victories. Um, I like to show this because after a hard fought campaign lasting nearly a year, our state bill to ban the confinement of egg laying chickens and the sale of eggs from caged chickens became law in Colorado. Um, and this was during the height of COVID. Um, when implemented, this legislation will help millions of chickens per year. And this is a picture of the governor of Colorado signing the bill. And it was it was pretty incredible because he actually signed it at a farm with free range chickens. So as he was signing the bill, there were there were chickens running around um, and, and being happy, which is incredible. We want to see other signs of success, though. We want to see tangible progress of animals getting out of cages. So because of victories like Colorado, according to the USDA, which is where this chart is from, we and our allies have moved the egg industry from roughly 5% cage-free around a decade ago to nearly 40% uh, cage-free now. We're really hoping to get to that 40% by the end of the year, which is a record high since cages became the norm. And that translates to over 120 million hens each year who will never have to suffer in a cage. And if you look at human populations, that's equivalent to the human populations of California, Texas, and Florida combined. 
We've also seen the number of mother pigs confined in gestation crates go from low single digits to 38% in recent years. Even economists with the National Pork Board are advising against building facilities with gestation crates, which again is a testament to, to how far we've come. But at the same time, um, to make, you know, we, we want to make cage-free progress, obviously, but we also want to reduce the number of animals raised in these industries to begin with. So right now in the food industry, there's a focus on animal proteins. And we want to balance that out. We want more of an emphasis on plant-based proteins, less on animal proteins. So in addition to being cruel to the animals who are kept on factory farms, the UN and other top organizations have said that eating meat is a key contributor to climate change, water and air pollution that poison our communities. And a landmark UN report um, that was released during the height of COVID on pandemic prevention said that the intensive confinement of farm animals is one of the top drivers of zoonotic disease emergence. And we're making progress here too. You know, you've probably seen the progress yourself. This is a picture that one of my colleagues took at her grocery store. Um, it's showing some of the newer plant-based meat alternatives on the market. Even fast food companies are, are getting into it. Um, this is, you know, Burger King for several years has, has offered the Impossible Whopper. Um, and so, you know, a lot of fast food companies are offering plant-based options now. And there's so many plant-based options on the market, um, even at the grocery store. This is um, just an example of the Gardein line of products, and it's great to see. So what are we doing to propel the shift to plant-based proteins? Well, our focus at HSUS, it's on dining services and food service companies. So companies that provide food for institutions like K through 12 schools, colleges, hospitals, even prisons and military bases. And this industry, we really feel like it's ripe for change. And so many other clients like, you know, high school students and college students are really driving the shift toward plant-based. And so what we do is we employ expert chefs, food service professionals, registered dietitians, and specialists in the art of menu development. Um, I always think it's interesting because a lot of times when people hear the Humane Society, they automatically think of dogs and cats, but we actually employ chefs, several of them. And these folks work across the United States. They build relationships with the largest food service companies in the country. They create plant-based menu concepts, and then they also lead in-person and virtual trainings to train chefs on how these menus um, and how to prepare plant-based items and, and how to label and, and market them as well. And the media is taking note. Um, this was the Washington Post. They reported on this, um, talking about how we've been working with some of the country's largest food service management companies to develop menus and train culinary professionals and e expand plant-based dining options. As one example, uh, Fresh Ideas, it's one of the larger food service companies in the United States. We partnered with them to create Mindful Fork, and that's an entirely plant-based concept and uh, debuted at colleges and universities, um, K through 12 schools, senior living facilities and corporate campuses. And the Fresh Ideas vice president said that Mindful Fork is now a focal point of their culinary programs going forward. And he noted that Fresh Ideas is committed to eventually providing one plant-based offering for every meat-based option at their accounts. And that's huge because that means half of their offerings will be plant-based. And, and what we found from the research is that the more plant-based options you have, the more, op the more offerings you have, the more likely people are to take them. Even if someone doesn't identify as being vegetarian or plant-based, they're, they're still more likely to try them if you have more options. As another example, we've been partnering with Sodexo, which is the second uh, largest food service provider in the United States. We've created hundreds of plant-based recipes for them, and now Sodexo is working to implement them and to offer these items at thousands of their locations. Um, in fact, working with us, this is pretty big news. Um, Sodexo announced that Sodexo Campus, so you know, which is basically the part of their company that uh, that services colleges and universities. 
that they actually increased their commitment to 50% plant-based menus by 2025. Um, they conducted an internal analysis and it showed that at least 70% of the company's U.S. supply carbon footprint was related to animal-based food purchases in the fiscal year 2020. So increasing the number of plant-based and plant-focused options on menus is part of the company's plan to reduce its global carbon footprint by 34%. We also have a ton of nutritious, delicious, and easy to make plant-based recipes on our website, uh, not just for institutions, but for individuals. This is just a sample of some of the dishes that HSUS chefs have created. So if folks are looking to incorporate more plant-based dishes into their diets, um, we definitely encourage you to check these, check these out. And I I feel like that's one of the exciting things I get to do um, at work. I don't always get to sample them, but I get to look at all the the pictures of <laughs> what our what our chefs have created. And again, this is just an example of some of the some of the recipes they've created. So, in summary, you know, practices like this they did not come about overnight, but we really believe that they will be relegated to the history books. And one of our jobs at HSUS is to show that these animals, like our dogs and cats at home, deserve compassion and justice. And we're going to keep fighting until all farm animal, excuse me, all farm animals are treated with respect and kindness. And one day we believe we'll be able to give animals a life that's worth living. And so that's my contact information right there. Please, if you, you know, we can definitely do Q&A and everything like that now, but um, if you ever have any questions or, or are more interested um, in our work or, or about farm animals, please um, don't hesitate to, to contact me. So again, thank you so much for having me. So... Okay, just had to unmute myself. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I want to impress upon people what a coup it is to get someone like Sodexo. Um, it is a huge um, uh, food service industry that works with schools, universities, hospitals, hotels, senior living. So it's really very impactful to get somebody like Sodexo on your side. So congratulations um, with that. That's a big deal. Um, oh, the you. other thing, yeah, um, I wanted you to just expand upon a little bit the gestation crates, because I think that sometimes we use this term, it's almost like a euphemism that, and it kind of goes over the head of some of our students. And if it's possible for you to just give them a little information about the um, repetitive pregnancies and what this gestation crate really means, because I think that... Um, you know, we're using this term. And like I said, it's it's almost like glossing over what's actually happening. And I don't think they understand what's really happening there. Yeah, absolutely. So a gestation crate, it's it's basically a metal bar cage. Um, it's it's barely bigger than the pig's own body. And so what happens is when the pigs start to be around six months old, and so th these are pigs who are used for breeding in the pork industry, they get put into these crates and so they're left in these cages where they can't turn around um all they the only movement they have they can lie down um, but they can only take about one step forward one step back and so then they're artificially inseminated they get pregnant they're left in the cages their entire pregnancy they're moved to different cages when they give birth to the piglets after they give you know they give birth they wean the piglets then Again, they go back into the crates for to try where they're impregnated again. And so it's basically four years. That's their life. I mean, they don't get a chance. They're they're not like running around the barn. They're not outside. I mean, they're basically in these crates for, for nearly their entire lives. And these are intelligent, they're social animals. That's the other thing. They don't get a chance to to interact um, with other pigs. Um, and so that's why I think that that Dr. Temple Grandin quote, that's why I always like to share that, that it really is the equivalent if we had to spend our entire lives in, in an airline seat, um, because that's what it's like. And so um, so the laws that, that we advocate for would ban those type of crates. And so, um, 
yeah, so usually what most producers will do when they can't use gestation crates, they'll put them in what's called group housing. So the pigs will actually be able to interact with other pigs. They'll be able to turn around and they'll be able to actually move. That's fantastic. Yes, and thank you because I really wanted our students to understand that the life of those pigs in particular are um, are for reproduction and that they are re-impregnated on a very regular basis. Um, and so thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, so we have this really impressive um, list or, or photo of companies that have adopted laws or said that um, they would probably phase certain things out over a period of time, right? Like, so I don't want the students to think that every single company on there has gone cage free, has gone crate free, has gone, um, you know, um, uh, free range chickens and that kind of thing. Um, but the ones that are on in that picture have at least opened the door for communications, have at least accepted some level of responsibility and have... Um, uh, said that they would phase them out by a certain time, whether it's 2030 or 2025 mm -hmm. or whatever. So I just, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I want um, the students to understand the reality. It was a fantastic list of, 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 you know, a lot of fast food, which I'm sure, you know, they all frequent on a regular basis, but I want them to understand that it's still a work in progress and that when you went back with the scorecard, there were some who weren't doing what they said they were they were supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can just elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm actually going to put a website in the, the chat. Um, so this has a list of all the companies that do have those commitments. Um, and it has when those commitments were made and then when they are also going into effect. So yes, that's that's very much true. A lot of the um, the companies on that list are not 100% cage free now. A lot of their deadlines to be cage free is the end of 2025. Um, excuse me. So some of them are are getting there, you know, and we're pressuring them to to get there quicker. Um, but yeah, a lot of those companies are are not entirely cage free um, now. But I mean, it, it does take some time, you know. So a lot of times when when a company makes a commitment, they usually need a little bit of time to to get those products from you know perhaps a different supplier or to work with their suppliers on ongoing cage free but yeah that website i think is a really good resource because it shows um what the different commitments are and then when they go into effect as well Great, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I think something else that you said was also really interesting because I think that, you know, we have a lot of students um, online right now joining us and a lot of them are, you know, still figuring out what they want to be when they grow up kind of thing. And, um, and I think that some of them might have the idea that working for the Humane Society, for example, you have to be an advocate for something and 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 that's it. So I really like how, um, you know, you can be an attorney, you can be a chef, you know, um, a CT State Norwalk has a wonderful culinary program um, that students can go through. And so there are options, obviously accountants and, 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 you know, other people as well, but I don't think that you know, students look at some of these conservation organizations and, and other um, societies as some place where they might be able to find a fantastic job from very, very diverse um, um, uh, areas of study. Yeah, and, and, and it's always interesting. I mean, uh, so our department of um, farm animal protection, we're about 20, we have about 20 folks on our staff, but working for HSUS in general, we have several hundred. So um, 
it's interesting because yeah we do we have chefs i mean one of our chefs used to work for disney one of our chefs used to work for hotels we have people we have someone who works for us who used to be a radio producer um you know educators folks who who used to be in teaching and so i really think that that there is a, a wide variety of careers in the animal protection movement and backgrounds i mean my my background was i was a theater major in undergrad um and so i got really into this idea of, you know, kind of using the arts and using theater to expose some of the problems that were going on in the world. And so um, through that, that kind of led me to working in a couple other animal groups. But yeah, I, I really think that there's not one path to get there. I, I think that um, there is a variety of, of paths, you know, if you're interested in working in the animal protection movement. But one of the things I, th I think is important too is to just volunteer and, and to get involved when you can, you know, um, because before I started working professionally in the animal protection movement, I did a lot of volunteer work. I still do a lot of volunteer work. So I think getting experience from that can be really key as well. Absolutely agreed. Um, and, 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 you know, and kind of getting your message across also, you would have to have, I guess, marketing and um, publicity people and um, uh, just, you know, a, a whole business majors. I'm sure that there's a host of majors that could find a, a really cool niche within some place like the Humane Society. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we have a whole communications department. So we have people who, you know, are good with working with the media and they write press releases. Um, and so, yes, there there really are, are so many different fields. You know, I think especially working for a larger organization, there's, there's definitely a lot of fits and a lot of different um, backgrounds that people have. Do any of the students or anyone else out there have a question? I don't want to monopolize the entire question asking <laughs> Q&A. <laughs> yeah, and if folks have questions and they feel more comfortable putting them in the chat, you know, I can, I can answer them there. Or if you want to unmute yourself, whatever is easier for you. There's oh, a that's a good question. Is pasture raised the more the most ethical type of animal product to buy? Yeah, that's a great question. I would definitely say so. So, I mean, I think it's important to be clear these cage free laws that that we advocate for these cage free policies um, for corporations they're not utopia. So. You know, if uh, an egg laying hen is in a cage free facility, they still don't get to go outside. They will still spend the majority, or not the majority, all of their life um, inside. But we think that, you know, being able to flap their wings, being able to move around, it's a drastic improvement from cages. That being said, um, yes, if you are looking for animal products, I would say pasture raise is the best because that means they actually get to go outside. Um, and they have a lot more space. I just had a quick question. I, I don't know if I'm audible right now, but uh, obviously these corporations prioritize profits over like everything. So mm -hmm. to eliminate gestation, what are they doing? Is it going to be significantly more humane or is it still gonna be a way that they can try to maximize you know, profits at the expense of the quality of life. Yeah, I mean, again, it's kind of like with cage free for eggs. So if you eliminate a gestation crate, you know, again, the mother pigs, they're not going outside. They don't have a ton of space, but they do have um, a lot more space than they would in a crate. They're allowed to interact with other pigs. They're allowed to turn around. They're allowed to move. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that that has allowed us to be successful with you know, working with the corporations and with legislation is that when we approach corporations, a lot of times we'll point to these laws that have been passed um, where these states have banned extreme confinement of farm animals. And we'll say, look, you know, there is a market for this. This is the way of the future and the future is cage free. And so um, so I think that a lot of the laws that have been passed have actually helped companies come to the table because they see that, you know, 15 states ban some form of extreme confinement. And so I think they see, oh, this is 
this is what's happening. So, um, but again, it's, you know, for mother pigs, it's, it's not perfect, you know, um, and, and we certainly acknowledge that, but we think them being able to, to turn around and be able to interact with other pigs and actually be able to move is significantly better than being in a cage. So it's moving it in that direction. And, and then um, right now, a lot of these companies are using um, terms like cage free, crate free, pasture raised um, um, as also a way when we look at the pricing of the items, those items with those um, tag phrases on them are generally more expensive than the other ones. And so in order to really encourage people, look, we all have a conscience and, and you know, people want to basically, for the most part, do the right thing and educating people about some of the realities of factory farming is huge, but we all have a budget as well. And so do you feel that as you become more and more successful and have more companies on board that the pricing will kind of equilibrate at some level? Yeah, that's such a great question. So yeah, we've noticed that too, that that a lot of times these grocery stores, it, and it's often the markets, right? Like it's the grocery stores, supermarkets, not necessarily the producers that will falsely inflate the prices because they know that, that people will spend more for a product that they view as more humane. And so what's happening though, the more laws that we can pass that have these sales standards that, that provide that you cannot produce or sell um, an egg, you know, that that's a product of a chicken in extreme confinement, the more the prices will go down. Because like, for instance, Michigan, where I'm located, we have a cage-free law. And so it'll go into effect at the end of next year. And so what what's going to happen is these these markets, you know, like grocery stores, they won't be able to charge that artificial premium anymore because um, because the standard will be cage free. And from a, a standpoint for our students, um, I always encourage them to um, advocate for um, something that they obviously um, support or believe in, but a lot of times they don't know where to start. And um, I might I might be wrong in this, uh, and you can you know kind of clarify. But I try to tell them you know start with some of your um, local legislators and start with people who are representing you know your hometown and then your state. Mm -hmm. In other words, the first person we're not going to write a letter to is Biden. You know we're going to try to do things on a local level with people that we may personally have voted for and put into some kind of local. Local office. So if a student who's listening right now wanted to know, um, you know, how they can become more involved, whether they picked a chicken or a calf or, or a pig, how can they, what, what would their first step be? Yeah, I, I think what you said about, you know, getting involved locally is so important. And that's, I, I mean, because passing legislation on a federal level is very difficult. And so um, there's only two federal laws that protect farm animals, and neither one of them has to do with how farm animals are treated on the actual farm. One has to do with how they're slaughtered, and the other has to do with how they're transported. And what's important to know, uh, chickens and other birds who make up like, 98% of the animal products that we eat in our country, they're exempt from those laws. So, um, so working on a local level is, um, is, you know, a lot easier. And so in Connecticut, actually, HSUS introduced a bill um, last year, and it'll be introduced again this year, a cage-free bill. So, um, you know, if there's ways that you want to get involved with that, you can definitely email me. But I think, too, you know, if there's a student organization on campus um, that advocates for animals, I think that's a great way to get involved. Um, and if there's not, um, you know, you could start one. <laughs> so, that's, you know, I, I was really involved in, in college with student organizations. And, you know, I, I think that's a great way to 
to start getting involved and and to also you know connect with some of the local state groups and and see what they're doing um and see if if you know if they need help with things um that's a good place to start okay we i am the faculty mentor for the environmental science club and um, and maybe, you know, look, we can link it, obviously, as you pointed out, to climate change and a lot of other um, environmental issues. It could fall under um, the umbrella of the Environmental Science Club, and maybe we can start small, like our cafeteria, <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, kind of move out from there. So, um, so definitely some really good... Uh, food for thought, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think it's really, really important for for everyone listening right now, in particular our students who, you know, I always think of as the next generation, um, to understand that there are some laws in place, as you mentioned, to help protect um, companion animals like our dogs and cats. And if you um, neglect or try to, um, uh, you know, uh, encourage them to fight and these kinds of things, you can be heavily fined and even serve jail time. Uh, yet the animals who are going to be our food are, are, are treated horribly. And so I, I think that we need to um, educate more people uh, about what's actually happening in the food industry. And um, and maybe that's where, you know, look, you bringing um, uh, um, you and inviting you and your story and your organization bringing th that into our classroom is major because we have, you know, 24 other people on here besides you and myself that we've you know hopefully given some information that didn't have before and maybe we just ask that each of you go home and talk to your family about some of what you learned today and um and kind of you know educate people that way and that could be the start of something as well um anything else that you could think of in terms of because i know sometimes when we come off these lectures we're all kind of fired up and i want students to have an outlet yeah, well, I, I think what you mentioned about, you know, working in the cafeteria, I, I think that would be fantastic. You know, it's like you can work in cafeterias to get a cage free policy, you know, to ask that cafeterias only serve um, cage free eggs. There's also working with them to get more plant based options. And so I think that you know, that's that's a really great thing to do. Um, I know that one of the things I've worked on when I was in school is that we had plant-based milks, but nobody knew about it because they like kept them behind. Um, and so uh, like behind the counter. And so, you know, to let people know, to have signage saying, you know, we offer these things, you just have to ask. Um, I did want to answer a couple of questions in the chat too. Is, is that okay? Or Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the students wanted to know about how many times pigs were impregnated during their lifetime there. And you had mentioned already that it is artificial insemination, but about how many times? Yeah, so pigs usually start being bred um, when they're about six months old, and then the gestation period is four months. So yes, they are artificially inseminated, and so they basically do, you know, cycles of that four months repeatedly and then they're usually um killed when they're between like two and four years old so i, I mean it's definitely you know if you kind of do like the math on that i mean i mean it's a lot they're pretty much spending their entire lives either pregnant or in farrowing crates which is when once they have their piglets and they're nursing their piglets okay that's that's a pretty strict cycle so six months there um, I guess sexually mature um, mm -hmm. in order to be pregnant, impregnated, um, and then impregnated more or less every four-ish months. Um, mm -hmm. so that's what the um, um, what a gestation period is is referring to. In case any of our students are unfamiliar with that with that term, um, and that is repeated every four-ish months until they're slaughtered at. Did you say two years old? They're usually between like two and four, depending on how productive they are. So, um, you know, a pig who is having lots of litters will probably be kept alive a little longer. But if the pig is not producing as many litters, they'll probably slaughter her sooner. 
Okay. And then another student had a question about um, things that are uh, meats that are labeled as kosher and what that's specifically referring to. Yeah, so my understanding of that is that it that it does have to do with with slaughter methods and and not necessarily the treatment of the animal before they're slaughtered. That that was my understanding of it as well. That it was laws governing the 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 actual killing of the animal, not necessarily how they were raised up until that point. Mm -hmm. Great yeah, question. And I mean, sometimes labeling, you know, unfortunately, it, it doesn't always, I, I mean, I think sometimes it's hard to tell too. Like, here's an example is, you know, I think sometimes if we're looking at like free range animals, you know, it, it sounds good, but really all that means is that they have to have a door to get outside. But sometimes, I mean, when you're talking about thousands of animals, like in chickens in particular, I mean, if they're at one end of the shed, because a lot of times these barns are they're more like sheds, are they even going to get out of the door? Are they even going to get out of um, outside? So um, so some of these labels there, um, you know, it's, it, they can be hard to understand. And sometimes what they sound like, they, they don't always mean. So the reality of, of what some of the labels are, they sound much, much nicer than some of them are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, even with cage free, I, I mean, all it means is that they're not in a cage. It doesn't mean that they have outdoor access or anything like that. It just means that they're not confined in a cage. OK, I think, guys, we have um, a lot of information, a lot of things to think about, hopefully a lot of things to share with other people in our lives. And if you are interested in um, going further with anything that you've learned, you have um, both Kate's um, email address, which she shared with you earlier, if you want to join on, um, on a larger level. Um, and if you wanted to start with something at um, CT State, Norwalk Campus, or in our Fairfield County, maybe you reach out to me and we try to put something together through the Environmental Science Club. And um, and and if um, I'm sure Kate's willing, if we have something we come up with, maybe we can bounce it off of you and get your expert opinion on how we want to move forward with something. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And I just put my email in the chat as well. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all of you spending your lunch hour with us. Thank you. And thank you, Kate, for spending your time with us. Um, this is the second time Kate has addressed our students at um, CT State Norwalk. And, um, and it's um, it's been fantastic and eye opening and a fantastic experience. And hopefully we'll be able to call on you again in the future. <laughs> yeah, I would love to anytime. I, I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, guys. And I will share this uh, this recording. Thank you for recording for us. And uh, and again, thank you for being with us. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Okay, Professor, should, you. We, uh, should we email you for attendance purposes or anything? Um, uh, uh, Kate took some screenshots um, and uh, you're going to provide a, a photo and your write up as usual for any extra credit item and you email that to me and let me know where you want the extra points. Okay, thank you, Professor. You're welcome, Andrew. All right, guys.